Let's talk about digital identity, the podcast connecting identity and business. I am your host, Oscar Santolaya. Hello, and thanks for joining another episode of Let's Talk About Digital Identity. And in these days, if one goes to a newspaper or in some other media, we hear, we read about vaccination passwords, immunity passwords, and similar terms and things that are already coming. But today we're going to have a discussion specifically about this with one of our partners, a company that has been before here in the podcast And they are working in that, in Immunity Passport. We are going to hear what has been their experience and what type of solutions they are bringing. So let me welcome back again to Sheherazad Davison. She is the CEO of Triceron Limited, a company that owns novel patented mutual authentication software using image passwords. Hi, Sheherazad. Hi, Oscar. Lovely to be back again. Yes, few months ago, uh, a bit more than one year ago, we were having a, a conversation. We talk about the very innovative product, the original product you have had for the last years that are neurographic passwords. So that's the super interesting conversation we had. So we'd like to hear first what happened on Tricerium, on the team, on the labs that you have there. And since this month, that's the last time we talked. So tell us a bit. Yeah, yeah. So really... I think for all of us who are working remotely, it's about making connections with potential partners and end users. It's about refining our message and positioning the company to leverage, hopefully, what will be a better 2021 compared to 2020. So yeah, we're feeling very positive of about our solution and obviously our other exciting projects, which we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Then I didn't know too much about that, that time when we talked last year, but now I know that you have been working on this immunity password even before that conversation. So that's one of the main things we talked today. Please to make it go start from the very, very basics. So what is an immunity passport? Yes, I think immunity passports, as people probably know, have been around for a long time, whether it was to prove that you'd had a disease and recovered from it, for example, like smallpox, or whether you can prove that you've had a vaccine, so for example, like yellow fever. So the idea and concept of an immunity passport is not really new as we know. Where I think the stakes are slightly different to do with COVID is because we're looking at something that is a global pandemic. So yeah, very happy to sort of talk a little bit about what we've been doing at Tricerian in this area. But just to make it perfectly clear, I think the world is only just beginning to talk about how an immunity passport for COVID would really work. Okay, there has been a concept that has been already for a while, as you said, but I think nobody was talking about this. It was not in the mainstream, at least, let's say, a bit more than one year ago. So now it came again. And, and also, I think you will tell me, you know more about this, that when people talk about immunity passport today, it's more about a digital version of that. So if you start telling us what are these... For COVID particularly, now it's, of course that's the situation we are, what are the, the use cases of this immunity password that we need today? That Basically, what are these different use cases of immunity password that we need today? Sure, sure. So maybe, if I may, if we go back to this time a year ago, which I'm sure for a lot of people feels like we've lived 10 years in just space of a year. In the UK specifically, we hadn't even had the first lockdown. First lockdown in the UK was 23rd of March. But what was fascinating is the UK government have got a grant scheme called Innovate UK. And around this time, as we went into the first lockdown, they asked companies across the UK to put in for a grant for a solution to COVID. And we didn't really envisage 
what that meant. The world was naive. We hadn't realised the impact this virus was going to bring. And that sounds a bit glib. And even now, I would say, Oscar, and you probably feel the same, there is so much still that we don't know about the virus. We're just at the beginning of understanding. And that's nothing to do with me and the UK in particular, but that's just a global effort from scientists. So we know a lot more than we did a year ago. And there are a lot of different teams working globally and also in the UK to actually understand and quantify this disease. So that, I think, is a positive. But in terms of where Tricerian fitted in, we put in for a digital vaccination passport and not because we knew that there would be any vaccines and that was the opportunity that we saw. We thought that if a vaccine, and we didn't even know if there'd be more than one vaccine and now there are several as you know, if a vaccine was available what could an individual do with that knowledge if they'd been vaccinated? And what I think is fascinating now is there are big debates about the use of vaccine stroke immunity passports. And remember, your immunity might come from the fact that you've already had the disease and recovered. Again, where it's, it's, it's very much a changing target about how a digital vaccination will be used and what we have done as Tricerian with our solution is we're part of the conversations that are being had by trade organisations such as Tech UK. We are part of the conversation with people like the Ada Lovelace Institute who are putting together papers about how these both physical and digital documents will be used. And remember, not all roads lead to a digital solution in a way. You've got to cater for some people who won't be able to use digital. They might not have a smartphone. So if you look at the backdrop of what people are trying to prove, they're trying to prove immunity. They might be trying to prove negative positive test status. They might be trying to prove that they've been vaccinated. And you can see how this straddles a wide variety of, one would say, moral or ethical issues, which actually, frankly, we're not here to solve. We've just come up with a solution that could be adopted by different groups and organizations, depending on what the use case is. And your project is called ImmuCheck, correct? ImmuCheck, ImmuCheck. So, yes. And... Would you like to probably know a little bit yes, how that please. would work? Yeah? Okay, so there are two things to think about in a way. Number one, obviously, to prove something to do with your health, you need to have a good audit trail. The data will need to come from, in all probability, a government-mandated database. And different companies have got different sophisticated databases that app developers can access. Some countries don't have a digital database. So again, therein lies one particular issue. Secondly, if you as a developer or an organization that wants to use patient data, there are very specific rules around GDPR HIPAA compliance, the audit trail about where the data is coming from. So that's something that needs to be considered. And obviously, one of the uses of a digital vaccination immunity passport is being able to prove you are who you say you are. So there are a number of solutions out there which tie your health data to your digital identity. And that's not a bad thing. But using digital identity as the main hook is also complicated. So what we've done with ImmuCheck is we've said our app allows you to prove that you as an individual have been vaccinated as the really light touch privacy first solution. Secondly, we've 
said, actually, there are lots of ways offline, so not digitally, that somebody can prove who they say they are by carrying a driving license, national ID card, a passport. So we've said at the very basic level, ImmuChex proves a person, say Oscar, has been vaccinated. Now, to prove your identity and to make it viable for real world situations, we've said you, Roscoe, also have to have another identifier that proves who you say you are with your ID card or with your driving license. So we've worked on the principle that less is more. And we haven't tried to do a combination with digital identity. Now, different solutions will require probably more in-depth identity checks. And we understand that. So I would say that ImmuChex is, at the very least, you could maybe go to a festival or you could go to the cinema. Now, if we partner with some other people, you could say that our solution could be part of a travel pass. And we can get into a little bit more perhaps about some of the standards that are going to be out there. And there are no standards at the moment. But our solution is meant to be quick, easy to use with a secondary piece of data that shows your identity. Okay, yeah, indeed. You mentioned, of course, that yeah, it's not going to be everywhere. This immunity password are not going to be everywhere fully digital. That, that's correct. That is in our best interest from all the governments and companies to make it digital. But I think we'll have to coexist with both. And depending where depends the use cases. And also it's quite interesting the way you explain that, yeah, putting the Delta identity component into this immunity password makes it, of course, much more complex. So in this moment, you said that ImmuCheck's app would also require that person will bring their ID, let's say, at the entrance of a festival concert. And that's one of the close use cases that are coming because I know that in summer here in the Northern Hemisphere, it's coming in, depends how you see it, three months, let's say, June, there will be festivals. Some of these festivals already are announcing, they're selling tickets, etc. So the organizers assume that they will, it's going to be possible. So they are, I assume, the first interested in having such solutions. How would it work in specific that case? Imagine just a festival organizer. So I think, to put it in context, I think the vaccination, the production of vaccines was a very interesting combination of government, private sector, and the public who were involved in the clinical trials across the world. So actually, in some ways, the production of COVID vaccines was the best of all possible worlds where governments, business and the public came together. And I think in that way, the use of vaccination passports or immunity passports or test passports will be the same. If you want to go to a festival, you're going to have to do certain things. And one of those might be, it could be that you have to have a test and some festival owners will say, well, actually, you've got to have a test between X days before, it's got to be negative, you've got to prove that. Or it could be, and these are where we straddle the sort of the bigger picture issues, are you going to have to have entrance to a cinema or a festival for those who have had a vaccine? So vaccinated people days versus people who haven't had a vaccine. So that's also something to think about. But at the very simplest level, the ImmuCheck solution is once you've registered on the app, by the way, you could also register children or your parents. If they didn't have a smartphone, you could register other people provided you have their permission And each individual has a unique QR code. And again, what I think is fascinating about COVID is the QR code that everybody said was maybe dead has come right back into the fore as a neat way to push someone and get data from a URL, right? So I think that's been, the QR code has had a revival. So the neat thing about ImmuChex is you, as Oscar, 
approving your immunity or your vaccination status, you will download the app on your device and it can be either on an iOS or Android device. And once you've registered, you will receive a unique QR code, which is all about you and it'll have your name above the QR code. And the way we've designed it very neatly is the verifier. So maybe it's the person that's allowing you into the festival at the gate. The verifier can download exactly the same app, but they don't need to register. All they use is the scan function within the app. So it's like a closed loop system. And they then get verification once they've scanned your QR code that you've been vaccinated. And that's it. And then that's you will show your ID or some other form of some identity proof that allows you to say, yep, I've odds so the verifier sees on their device your name and that you've been vaccinated. And then they will look at your ID card and see that the picture matches you and that's it. Now, if we manage to partner with the festival, we might say, well, actually, we'll do all those checks beforehand and then you can produce it on some sort of wristband, which is valid for the festival. So I think industry or different sectors will want to see what's the minimum proof they need to allow their event to go ahead. And sitting next to someone in a restaurant is really different to going to a festival. So the use cases will, I think, dictate the detail of what's needed. And obviously travel is one that straddles airlines, governments, security. That will be taken care of by some of the big organizations involved in areas where governments have got a deep interest, not least from a security perspective and not least from We've seen how borders have been closed because you don't want different variants to come in. I think one of the things we need to understand is, as I said, where everything is still so new. We don't understand so much about the disease. But as time goes by, there's a trade-off between keeping lockdowns and people's freedoms and then the heavy lifting of the vaccine and what that does to people's health if they catch the virus. And again, this is all evolving. So at Tricerian with Immutex, we've been very flexible. We're interested in partnering. We want to understand how we can add value to different industry groups. And I think certainly hospitality is somewhere where we're interested. I think Places like cruise ships are fascinating. If you can create a biosphere where passengers and crew have proven they've been vaccinated, then in the reverse to what happened to all these poor people who were stuck on a cruise ship at the beginning of the pandemic and they were all getting coronavirus and all getting infected, this is kind of the reverse of that, where you've created a good biosphere where everyone's been vaccinated and okay you might still need to wear a mask if you're getting off a ship and going around somewhere else but actually that gives us some opportunities to think innovatively about how this could work. Similarly children aren't being vaccinated at the moment there's no plan to vaccinate under 18 year olds but you could see how if you could incorporate something like a test, a negative test, you could create an app for kids. And our app includes our picture password solution. So that would be, again, quite nice for maybe younger children to be able to use and prove they've had a negative test. And again, Oscar, I don't think that one company can take on what essentially could be the moral arguments of I haven't had a vaccine, I choose not to be vaccinated, therefore I'm being discriminated against versus the uptake of vaccination in the UK is incredibly high. Now that might be different for different countries, but we're saying that there has to be some sort of solution that shows that you're either negative, tested negatively, you've got immunity or you've been vaccinated. 
And I think most people who want to go back to a semblance of normality would want that. So it's putting that onto the individual to agree that they want their health data to be used. They trust the solution. And that's the other thing I think is really important is all the companies that are producing these sorts of solutions, it's about trust. Trust is at the heart of trusting the data, you as the individual proving you are who you say you are, and what are the implications, the wider implications for society. And those are big questions to answer. So we're at the beginning of the journey, but I'm sure there will be solutions that are digital that will help unlock various segments. Yeah, but you illustrate in these several use cases potential. Yeah, it shows that there will be whatever the number of providers that, that will have some solutions like the one you have of immunity password. There will be so many possibilities of integration, very simple, as you say. You explain the case of the event organizer, the festival organizer, who in that case could have a major integration with a solution like yours or can be even more complex. Yes, definitely. And yeah, it also depends who is willing to try this first. No? For instance, in these events that are coming in the summer are coming pretty soon, but there will be others who will wait, some others that will be willing to take it immediately. Yes, and I'm putting it out there. If there is any festival organizers who want to contact us, then please do. We're always happy to have an open discussion. But I think the other area that's interesting is the mobile phone operators. We could be part of their mobile phone app. Why not? We could partner with, I don't know, some streaming services that go straight to your phone, perhaps, where they might want to sponsor something. So there are opportunities here, but it's fundamentally, it's about trust. It's about accuracy. It's complicated, but I think there's a way forward. And always in life, and especially in technology and tech, you've got to try things, right? You might not get the most optimal solution when you first start, but that's the whole point. If you don't try, you wouldn't invent anything. Sure, sure. And something that some people might be already asking themselves, okay, I'm willing to use these apps, of course, because I want to go to events or restaurants or travel, etc. I'll be willing definitely to use these apps. But what about the most critical requirements such as privacy, security? Could you tell us more what would be the most essential requirements for these type of solutions? Sure. I think the main thing is, depending on what your use case is, you don't really want the very nice person at the nightclub door to know your intimate health details. And they don't need to. They just need to know that you are who you say you are and that you've been vaccinated or that you have immunity as deemed by the app. And we talked a little bit about, we didn't really talk about standards, but I think there are a number of organizations that are coming together to create a standard and that goes to your privacy and data question and that also goes to trust. Organizations that are producing these apps, you don't need to know everything about the individual. You just need to know certain pieces of information and therein lies a lot of people who are sort of very negative about this concept are saying that this is the big state potentially creeping to get everything they know about you. But the state probably knows quite a lot about your medical records anyway. As long as you trust that the data being taken is the minimum required, there shouldn't be a problem. But this is all about education and understanding what you're doing. And in terms of understanding what rights you are giving the app to reach. And that there are a whole load of regulations around HIPAA compliance. So this is a well-trodden path. We know the use of medical data is probably very well regulated. Very much more so than perhaps the data that you give away to social media companies. Okay, so we're already starting from a positive backdrop. And that's why standards are very important. So it could be that app developers who are producing these solutions say, we adhere to XYZ standard. And that will cross over GDPR, HIPAA, 
standards for immunity passports. We know that Microsoft, Salesforce, the Common Pass Project, they're very focused on producing a common standard. And I think standards are great because then everybody can say we adhere to a standard. It's like a kite mark. Again, complicated, but as long as the end user is confident that their data isn't being used inappropriately, then that's great. I mean, governments are very good with the test and trace apps that have been produced by governments across the world. Some people are reluctant to take them on because they think that government is snooping on them for a good reason in a way, because they need to know if you've been infected. But In some ways, the vaccination immunity passport solution is that the individual is empowered. They are giving permission for the proof to be shown. And I think that's a different psychology. And I also think keeping it separate from test and trace is also why people would not worry and they would use it. So there are some organizations, companies as well working on standards of maybe very early still, but there's this work already going on. Yes, yes. And in the UK, there's the Ada Lovelace Institute that are writing a big paper on this. And they are taking their time to produce something for government in the UK as well. There's government minister Michael Gove has been tasked with understanding immunity passports, vaccination passports, because people want an answer. I think that's the other thing that there's so much talk about it. I don't think any of us can open a newspaper or go online without vaccination immunity passports being somewhere in a newspaper because people want to know. People want to know how it's going to work. And I think, again, who's giving consent? Is it government dated? And it's all about trust and privacy. So some really major issues. But I think our solution is... We've tried to keep it very simple. And that's it. The more complexity you have, then the more hoops you have to jump through. And we've said, actually, let's just keep it really simple because then you can get utility. And of course, I mean, international travel has got a different level of complexity. So we're pitching ours as a closed loop system. You want to go to a festival. You want to go on a cruise. You want to go to a series of restaurants. This is a way that it could work. We don't know the final shape, but I think industries, different industries and businesses want to have a solution as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Very interesting to know all the work you have been doing about this vaccination passwords and this ImmuCheck project. It's also very possible to try it. Yeah. Yeah. We've got a beta test. So do reach out if you've got the test flight app we can arrange for people to have a go and you could install it in two different ios devices perhaps and then somebody could scan someone else and pretend to be the verifier and it works i've actually used a qr code over skype as a test and it works (laughs) interesting one last question and this may be a bit out of the main topic but for a closing idea that you can share with anybody listening to this interview for any business leader listening to us right now what is this one actionable idea that you think they should write on their agendas today i think it's about communication oscar it's checking in with your staff your customers your family and giving yourself a little bit of a break and time off I think remote working, there are pros and cons, but fundamentally, humans are personable people. We love to be with others, right? Not everyone's a hermit. There are some people who like it less than others, but we thrive on talking and laughing. I think that's the other thing that the pandemic and working from home for a lot of us has been tough, is that that human touch the spontaneity that you can't get on a Zoom call. And also the thing with the Zoom is like, if everybody's talking at once, it's just a bit of a nightmare. It's very different when you're in a room with someone. But I think really it's about communication and making sure if we still have to work from home for a while, 
just to take the time to check in with your staff in the leadership role, just to see how people are feeling. And it's not about how many people have you rung and how's your software development going and where's the project. It's actually having that 10 minute conversation about what's going on in their lives. And that requires some effort on part of leaders. But I think really, especially during this time, it's those things that will keep your staff happy and loyal. And that's what we want when we come out at the other end. And I think that's the other thing. I think this will pass. And that's quite an emotional thing to say. The science has shown the world can cope with this. It's tough. And it's going to be difficult, but we have to have hope, right? And that's the key message, I think. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for that. I think it's super important what you're saying about communication, checking in all people who are important for you, people you work with, none of your colleagues. If you are the leader of an organization, well, make sure that you know that are well in the, also the personal level is important. People will be happy to hear from you, to have some conversation even unexpected. Uh, thanks a lot, Shahrazad, for bringing us all this uh, very important topic today that is the vaccination immunity passports. Um, please let us know how people can learn more about your project or get in touch with you. What are the best ways? Sure. The website, there's a contact form there. I will post this on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me there. Please reach out. We've got a lot of posts around what we're doing we just posted something today about cruise pass so yeah you can find me i'm there in the ether mm -hmm. tricyron.com correct thank you thank you yes again thanks a lot to have us for this interview and all the best thank you oscar thanks for listening to this episode of let's talk about digital identity produced by ub secure Stay up to date with episode at ubsecure.com slash podcast or join us on Twitter at ubsecure and use the hashtag LTADI. Until next time. <laughs>